um, we'll need to get together. Now, um, Karen, she wanted to say something before we get started. Go ahead. Work. My husband's doing well, so thank you. Thank you. And I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it for you. Uh, Karen, we prayed for her husband as he was undergoing a procedure that was a little bit fraught with fear last time, and he is home doing very well, and uh, she just wanted to uh, thank us for prayers. Uh, we have to lift each other up, take care of each other. That's our job in the body of Christ. That's how we do one another. And when you do a word study of one another in the scripture, it only applies to believers. When it says, love one another as I have loved you, that it applies only to believers. Not to non-believers? You're to, you're to love your enemy and do good, but one anothering is different. Do a word study on one another and you will be, it, it's, it's over a hundred times. I did that study and I forgot the number. It's a hundred and some times in the New Testament. And it's a very rewarding word study because you learn something about one another. It's a special bond between believers that doesn't exist with everybody else. So that's part of it, lifting each other in prayer, especially in a hard time, so, or difficult time. Okay, let's take a look here. I want you to, uh, we won't, I didn't send any handouts this time, but I'm going to refer to a couple of things from before. Um, it's not necessary that you have them, but I'll share screen and you'll be able to see it. But there are a couple of things that we'll need to refer to from before that we've already talked about. And we're going to come toward the end of this book, <laughs> Lord willing, today. And uh, you will see that. Um, when we get um, into Deuteronomy, we'll have the first little bit of Deuteronomy next week. The first four chapters are really an extension of numbers. It's not, there's really not so much of a division there, but you will see that uh, Deuteronomy takes place in 30 days, only about 30 days. So numbers, of course, was over 38 years. <laughs> so it's, it's quite a different kind of a scenario. And, and let's take a look now and, and, and ask the Lord's blessing on us as we gather around his word this morning. Thank you, Heavenly Father, again for each person here who's brought an open heart to hear your word. Thank you for this joyous time of the season when we are reminded of just what you came, who you are and what you came to do in this very dark world. There are swirls of concerns around us in our nation and in the world, but we know that you are Lord of all. And we're so thankful for that hope that you've given us. Bless us now as we take a look at these chapters at the end of Numbers and see what it is that you have to teach us in the continuing school of the wilderness that we've been studying in this book of Numbers. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for bringing us safely here this morning and bless us in your name. Amen. Okay. We're coming uh, sort of to the, we're at the end of the uh, wilderness uh, traveling, if you will. And we are in the area of, let me see here if I, yeah, let me share screen just for a minute and take a look at um, 
the map. This is from before. You had this last week. And I just want to let you know that we, of course, have seen all of those travels coming. And we're up here in the area that is just on the east side of the Jordan River. And we're in a, a location. Um, let me uh, close this one and open this one. Um, hopefully everybody can see, this is not on the handout, but this is just a real close up picture of, uh, it depends on your translation. If you read that very first line in chapter 25 of Numbers, while Israel was staying in Shittim, in some of your translations, some will say the Acacia. Uh, Acacia is a, a different uh, translation of the same word. Um, it is uh, an area in the plains. Remember, this is just below the Pisgah mountain range and Mount Nebo is here, which we'll um, look at here in just a minute. Baal Peor is what we need to pay attention to. Heshbon is mentioned, but this is the place that they have camped for several weeks now. They've been in camp here, uh, preparing to cross the river. This is the second generation. And we'll look at the census here in just a minute uh, to remind us of that. But uh, let me stop sharing for a second. And uh, we're going to look here at these pages in, or these uh, verses in chapter 25, because this uh, lists an incident called the incident of Peor, which is the, one of the high places in those Pisgah Mountains that we were talking about before where Balaam and Balak got together and offered sacrifices to try to offer a curse against Israel and Balaam couldn't curse Israel. It wouldn't come out of his mouth. He couldn't do that. But apparently he, Balaam and Balak, we'll find out in chapter 31 here in a minute, talked about things differently than curses. Just between the two of them. And apparently Balaam suggested, well, I can't curse Israel. God will not allow me to say a curse against Israel. So let me just tell you, if you want to get to them, you tell some women to get in there, some of the foreign women who have their own gods and Often they will be prostitutes of those gods because that was the sort of god Baal was, is a, a fertility god, and they would use uh, the rites of prostitutes and so forth. And so you send them in there amongst all those men who've been in the wilderness for 38 years, and, and you'll, you'll destroy that country. That's one thing. If you can get them to uh, worship idols, it's over. It's over. And that will be your end. And that's where we're setting up. You need to know that that's what's happening. Now, remember, I talked about what that discussion was up way up in the mountains, overlooking down in the plain where Israel was staying. And I thought to myself, that's principalities and powers up there planning our demise, just like in the heavenlies in Ephesians that Paul talks about, they're in the heavenlies and there is this spiritual warfare going on to destroy God's people. That's been the plan since Genesis 15, get rid of God's people. So I think that's what's going on, and that's how Satan enters into the picture. And let's pick up with that knowledge now in Numbers 25, chapter 25. And we'll just go through the 
uh, first uh, oh, 15, 16 verses because that sets the stage for the rest of the time getting into uh, finishing up numbers. And remember, after this time, it will be known, or this incident that is described here, this will be known as the matter of Peor. And it will be referred to all the way through the Old Testament and a couple of places, um, it's not listed by name, but it's referred to in the New Testament. And it will be the matter of idolatry entering into the camp, entering into the nation. And it was a problem until Nebuchadnezzar took down Jerusalem, which would be a thousand years later. So it was, it was a big problem. It worked very well to begin with. And so Satan kept it going, bringing in false teachers. False teaching was the thing that Paul wrote about to Timothy right at the beginning of the very first class we ever had, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Remember, we talked about the silly women who believed what they were being told by false teachers. And I was saying, and this, this would be 29 weeks ago, <laughs> plus the breaks. So that would have been a long time ago. But remember, I, I was saying, let's all be silly women. Let's know what the scripture says so that we won't fall into it. It's, it's very rampant, it's very rampant in our churches. And we have to know what the truth is. So let's take a look. Israel was staying in Shittim or the Acacia Grove, depending on your translation. The people began to prostitute themselves with the women of Moab. That's the plain, and the mountains are next to it, and the king of Moab is Balak, the guy that was talking to Balaam. So that's where they are. The people prostituted themselves. Not just the sexual act of prostitution that is discussed here, but when it, a whole people prostitute themselves with themselves with the women of Moab, what does their saying? They're buying pleasure for themselves. The women invite him, invited them to sacrifice for their gods exactly what was the setup to get into the people and destroy them from within. And the people ate and bowed in worship to their gods. What a, what a tragedy. This is the second generation that has been in place now for quite some time and no better. But they did it anyway. We have to recognize how powerful the enemy is. Okay, so Israel aligned itself with Baal of Peor. That's why it's called the incident of Peor. The Baal worship had uh, sites all around Canaan, um, up in Phoenicia, over in areas around Damascus. They had highlights, but uh, the Baal worship would be associated with a location it was all similar kind of worship uh, of idols, but uh, it would be Baal of so-and-so, Baal of so-and-so, and we'll see that for the rest of the uh, Old Testament. Well, when Israel aligned itself with Baal of Peor, something's going to happen. You know it's going to happen, and we see what happens in response. The Lord's anger burned against Israel. Oh, what a terrible thing it is to fall in the hands of an angry God. 
fall into the hands of an angry God. He will not be mocked. And he will correct that situation. So, the Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord so that his burning anger may turn away from Israel. The leadership allowed this to happen to Israel. They did not stand up against it when the people wanted to do it. If you'd had one or two, that would have been one thing, but it says the people, that the nation, the whole nation was moving in this direction. And so um, do you think the Lord messes around with idolatry in his people? Capital crime, capital crime. Execute them in public. I want everybody to see how I, the Lord, feel about idolatry in my people execute them that's a yucky job isn't it it's a yucky thing to kill off sin among the people these were their brothers these were their family members they knew these people they had to look them in the face and kill them terrible terrible thing for both sides the one who's killing and the one who has to do the killing, who's, who is being killed. It just is a horrible situation. We, we have to understand how desperately terrible it is to fall in the hands of an angry God. Do you think the church today could fall in the hands of an angry God? It does and is and will. <laughs> it does. We can't minimize this. And then we have a little incident here as part of this. An Israelite man came bringing a Midianite woman. Now, remember, uh, we're in the plains of Moab, and Balak is the king of Moab. But remember what he had done before uh, he got to Balaam? He had made an alliance with the Midianite kings. And there were five of them in that area, which we'll see uh, later. And he said, I'm going to need some help against this people because they've already defeated Ammon and uh, the, the other kings around me. They've already defeated them. I want some help. So he made an alliance with Midianites. Now, Midian were descendants of Keturah and Abraham. <laughs> uh, Moses married a Midianite woman. So they have history as well. But so this was a, probably a priestess from the uh, tribe. We read la later that this Israelite man is from the tribe of Simeon. And the woman is the daughter of one of their um, kings, I think it was. His relatives in the sight of Moses and the whole Israelite camp, this is verse 6 of 25, while they were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting that was just outside the east gate of the tabernacle, outside the fence, this would be at the entrance place where you would bring your sacrifices for worship, the uh, uh, people were weeping. Why were they weeping at that place? All those leaders and others had been executed in public, and there was public mourning and realizing not only was all the death of their people, but they were mourning their um, idolatry and their uh, um, sinning against the Lord. So they were mourning. And a fellow by the name of Phineas. Now, who is Phineas? He is the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron. So Aaron had died already. His son, Eleazar, is now the chief priest or high priest. And he is sort of the priest over uh, the worship of, of uh, at the tabernacle. And his son, Phineas, 
would be the next in line, perhaps. It, uh, I don't know how many sons uh, at this point, Eliezer, uh, I'm sure he had others, but at this point, one of his sons by the name of Phineas, um, um, he is uh, turned, uh, it, says, it says that he saw this uh, Israelite man take this Midianite woman into a tent for the purpose of sexual encounter. He saw this happening. This is while they're mourning for doing what they had just done and what the Lord had sent his wrath against them for. He's doing right out in public what everybody else was being punished for. And so this man, Phineas saw this, he got up from that assembly of mourners, took a spear in his hand and followed that man into the tent and stabbed through the both of them while they were in the act. It says it went through the belly of the woman. Symbolic, I'm sure. But I mean, talk about being caught in the act. They were and instantly, of course, died. And um, it um, and then a plague of Israelites was stopped. Apparently there had been a plague released with the anger and the wrath, which often happens that the Lord sends a plague. And uh, with that action that Phineas took, apparently seen by a number of people, and of course by the Lord, this plague was stopped. But how many died? Look at verse 8. How many died of the plague and the wrath? 24,000 people died. This is, to this point, the highest number who were killed at once of Israel. That's a lot of people, 24,000 people. What would happen in this country if something came through and over the period of a couple of days or three days, 24,000 people were killed they from plague? I'm sure anybody would. I mean, I can't even imagine what we would hear people trying to figure out the reason for what to do about it. But I wonder how many people would say it's God punishing us. Anyway, 24,000 died. The, uh, the picture here of destroying by death and turning back the wrath, which is the next uh, verse 11. Phineas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the Israelites because he was zealous among them. Because of what he did, he turned back my wrath. That, if you read the Hebrew, is he propitiated my wrath. Remember that word, big word, propitiation? It's in your uh, 99 essential doctrines if you want to read it up again. But the word propitiation is an action that turns back God's wrath. That was the cross. The cross was Jesus turning back the wrath of God on sin. That's what it is. The, we are under God's wrath because of sin. So propitiation, turning back my wrath. Verse 12, therefore declare, I grant him, Phineas, the Lord speaking of Phineas, I grant Phineas my covenant of peace my covenant of peace 
It will be a covenant of perpetual priesthood for him and his future descendants. We're going to be able to track Phineas's descendants all the way through Zadok, who was the priest for David, King David. That's a long time, almost a thousand years. So it was a perpetual priesthood through Phineas. So Aaron, Eliezer, Phineas, and then his descendants. And, and, and we can follow that as we go through the scripture. Why? Because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the Israelites. The picture of I, I don't want my people to treat God this way. I want to show people they cannot treat God this way. And I need to stop God's wrath for what we have done. We have one more little piece of information. The name of the slain man was struck dead with the Midianite woman. Uh, the the uh, was a Simurai, the, the guy was Sim, uh, the son of Simurai, uh, leader of the uh, Simeonite family. Simeon was the second of the sons of Jacob, and he had a tribe. And I want to show you something when we get to chapter six, 26 about that. And the Midianite woman is named. I think it's quite interesting in scripture. When this man's named and the woman is named, who these two who were made examples of what needs to be done when idolatry enters the camp. Put a spear through it and kill it. Right when they're doing it. The Lord told Moses, attack the Midianites and strike them dead. For they attacked you with a treachery that they used against you in the pure incident, which is what we've just described, where the people prostituted themselves with the gods of uh, pure. They did the same in the case involving their sister Cosby, daughter of a Midianite leader who was killed in the day the plague came uh, to pure. Jump over with me to chapter 31 now uh, of Numbers. It's a few pages over. We'll come back to 26, but I want you to just jump over for a minute while we're still thinking about this incident uh, at Peor. We're going to uh, continue with that in chapter 31. We'll have to go back to the census taking and so forth because that's how they determined uh, how many fighting men there were to go to this battle we're going to talk about, but uh, jump to 31 because this is really the rest of the story. We'll go back here in just a minute uh, to uh, chapter uh, 26. So sort of continuing in that God told Moses, you're going to have to make war against the Midianites because of what they have done to these people. What did they do? They brought in idolatry through women who um, uh, the men prostituted themselves with the women, and some of them may have uh, taken them to marry. That happens uh, in other places in the Old Testament. They would take farm wives, and they had been told in the commandments that are listed in Exodus, don't marry foreign women because you will bring their idols into your people into the people. They were told that hundreds of years ago. But this is a second generation. And it looks like the Lord's going to have to teach them some lessons too, because they didn't get it. Yes, Sarah. The Midianites felt about that. Pardon me? Because she was a Midianite. Wasn't no, he was a, his wife was. 
Uh, but when the Lord tells you, execute these people, your own family in front of everybody else, because you're not going to be quibbling with the Lord about the kings who brought it to you. Obedience sometimes is very difficult, isn't it? And we can't let family determine how we do things, especially if our family has gone astray. It has to be God first, then family. Family is extremely important, and it is to the Lord. But we can't let how we feel about our family members determine how we, whether we're obedient to the Lord, I would say. Yeah, it was a family. Now, the Midianites were a large group, very large numbers of tribes. It may not have been the same tribe as his wife was from. Okay, 31. Again, the Lord further speaks to Moses, execute vengeance. Kind of circle that word. This is the first time that word appears in scripture. Vengeance. So what is vengeance? We have our ideas and we've heard, everybody remembers the verse, uh, don't take your vengeance out. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Well, yeah execute vengeance he calls it his vengeance later on even in the same um, paragraph here but vengeance is in the scripture strictly speaking the tool of the lord to dispense his curse now remember he offered blessings and cursings in the covenant with abraham remember those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. Are we together? This is the covenant with Abraham, which starts the whole thing with Israel. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as we see over and over and over again. So <clears throat> what have they done? What has the... The kings of Midian, the Midianites, what have they done to Israel? They cursed Israel with their bringing in idolatry to, to destroy them. And we'll find out in verse 16 of chapter 31, where uh, we are told that Moses was told it was Balaam who told Balak to do this, if you read uh, the rest of chapter 31. So vengeance is punishment inflicted in retaliation for injury or offense. Now that's our English definition. There is a reason why we inflict our punishment um, uh, on, on another. When we're talking about justice, it's um, sometimes listed as, as, take, as giving justice or uh, achieving justice with somebody. But for scripture, vengeance is just retribution or recompense or punishment, which is ordained by God. When he said, execute all the elders who participated in bringing idolatry into the people in public, that was his vengeance against them, his wrath against them, his curses against them. But in the case of vengeance against others, it's because of the curse against his people, God's people. If, they, if, if you curse God's people, you will be have vengeance taken out on you by God. And he uses people to carry out the deliverance of those curses. And that's what he's uh, ordaining here in um, chapter 31. 
we read that word vengeance is mine. Um, it's uh, in uh, chapter 32, chapter 35, chapter 41, chapter 43 in Deuteronomy, when we get to Deuteronomy, because he will talk about carrying out vengeance against Canaanite uh, people and their gods because of what they have done uh, to the land. So um, we have to always associate with God's permissive punishment on others, that word vengeance. It is his permissive punishment on others, but it's his punishment. We may be used to do it, but it is his punishment and his ordain. It is um, always associated, when we read about it in scripture, it's always associated with injury or destruction, um, associated with the injury or destruction on those who hurt or inflict injustice on my people. It's always associated with my people. So, as I said, uh, this chapter 31 is the first mention of vengeance, and it would be the commissioning um, of Moses. His last act as the leader of Israel would be leading them in war against the Midianites. And there were five kings of the Midianites that, will, that they will go against. And this was commissioned. And we're told later on that when this is done, you're going to climb up the mountain and, and I'll take you and gather you to your people. So this is the last job of Moses as the leader of Israel. And we'll go back to that in a minute. So uh, when the Lord commissions the destruction of a group of people who have injured or caused injury to his people, that will be described as a holy war. The first time it happened was with the Amalekites at Rephidim, way back with the first generation. Remember when um, um, uh, uh, Aaron and Hur held up the Mo uh, Moses' arms while the battle was going on and uh, Joshua was, was their uh, general and they fought under the banner of the Lord. That was where we first uh, read about the banner of the Lord, fighting under the banner of the Lord. That makes it um, a God permissive war. And it is commissioned by the Lord and he determines how many are to fight the terms of the engagement to fight always under the banner, the priest and the holy objects, uh, such as the Ark of the Covenant, were to go ahead of the people, and they were to uh, sound the silver, silver trumpets to call the assembly of the people to, to go to war. So there was a particular pattern which will be followed throughout the rest of the Old Testament when we speak of the Holy War. This is going to serve as the model of how they will have to then work when they go across the river into Canaan and defeat. It will turn out to be 31 battles over 20 years. But this is the this is the model and this is the pattern. The spoils of this holy war were always used in support of the house of the Lord. Never, uh, and maybe for the nation as a whole, if there were things that the nation as a whole could benefit from. For instance, if you took in spoils of war a whole bunch of animals or grain or other things that could be used by all of the people. Never individual gain. And we'll see that in the book of Joshua coming up. We'll see what happens when you try to gain 
for yourself. It happens in several places in the Old Testament. Never for your own gain. Obedience to the rules of engagement were absolute. God defined the rules of engagement, and they had to be followed precisely. No blessing or, or tithe or tribute uh, would be given if you didn't follow the rules exactly. The very first time a tithe to the Lord was offered after a battle, anybody remember? The very first time, it wasn't called vengeance, but it was uh, ties to the Lord after a battle, which the Lord, huh? Abraham, when he went and fought the five king, the four kings and the five kings who uh, had taken Lot, remember that? The kings were defeated, had to go back home without anything, and Abraham offered tithes to the Lord how? Melchizedek. Well, Melchizedek. That was the original pattern, which continues. So that was in the first generation? Pardon me? Was that in the first generation? No, that was Abraham. That was 430 years before Israel was a nation. Way, way, that's history. Way ancient history at this point. But they need to connect that they exist because of the covenant made with Abraham. This nation exists because of that covenant. And nothing else. Yes. Except back then, because Abraham refused to take the gift. Yeah. That was the pattern. The Lord gave me the defeat of my enemy, and I didn't lose any of my men. That was a holy war pattern. Therefore, I recognize it was the Lord's battle. He fought the battle for me, and I offer my tithe in gratitude to him. That, that's a good point. That's, a, that's the pattern. And that was way before Israel was a nation. It was just the, the, the tribe sort of, of Abraham, which was kind of slim at that moment since it was just him and Sarah <laughs> when that battle happened. So, because Lot had been, had separated himself. So, that the next time we read um, significant information about this tribute is when David does the same thing when he honors the Lord for the defeat, finally, of the Philistines. And it will take a long time before that happens. So, we will read um, later in chapter 33 of Numbers, if you do not drive out the inhabitants, and he was telling them, this is how you're going to have to fight. This is how you're going to have to deal with Canaan. When you go in, this is this is how I'm preparing you to deal with all that. And if you don't drive them all out, they will be irritants in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They didn't drive them all out. And would you describe that today as they still have irritants in their eyes and thorns in their sides in Israel? Absolutely. Because they didn't, it's a yucky job killing all the enemy. That's a terrible, terrible, horrible job. Horrible job. War is terrible. Yes. I know obviously all that happened in the Old Testament is literal stories. They're not symbolic. But is there an also metaphoric of the Spanish World War? Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, Caroline, that's a very good point. Um, yes, these are instructive of actual wars that took place, but they are instructive to teach us. Remember, there was a spiritual war going on that caused this fighting war. 
And yes, what are we told? We must, the Lord is the one who fights the battles, but he will send us to get rid of all of the things that cause idolatry, injustice, immorality, any of those things in our lives. Spiritual warfare, absolutely. These, it is vengeance on the Satan in our own lives. But we, we have to learn we don't do the battle. We can't. So let's look back at uh, chapter 31 here for a minute and look at the rules of engagement that are listed there. Equip some of your men for war. This is back in chapter 31, verse three. They will go against Midian to inflict the Lord's vengeance on them. Okay, that's your mission. Every general has to know exactly what it is that I'm sending my men to do. What is my what is my mission? And this is the mission. Inflict the Lord's vengeance on them. The Lord's vengeance is utter and complete. Send 1,000 men from each Israelite tribe. Did he say, well, the smaller tribes only have to send 800 and the bigger tribes have to send 1,200, you know, because we need to be fair. No. Exactly the same is required from each tribe, no matter its size or anything. So 1,000. 1,000 were recruited, and so you had 12,000 equipped for war. Moses sent 1,000 uh, from each tribe, and they went with who? Phineas. What was his job? Go ahead and done with the article we have here. You go with my presence, the ark. You go with my presence before you. Where? What was the ark? The place where God said, I will meet you at the mercy seat between the, the cherubim on the mercy seat. So that was his the picture of his presence goes before when we get to Jericho the first battle they fight when they cross the river this is the same picture so in whose care Phineas got rewarded wasn't Eliezer it was Phineas because he had declared his zeal for the Lord and the Lord rewarded him and he had the care of the holy objects and the signal trumpets, those two uh, silver trumpets that we read about earlier. They waged war against Midian as the Lord had commanded and killed every male. Do you think they got the message from before? Don't leave any parts of it, Lee, kill every male. Well, we let's read on. Along with them, they killed the, the uh, Midianite kings, and there are five of them listed there. They also killed who? Ah, uh, Balaam was hanging around watching what was going on uh, to see if what he had suggested to Balak and Midian would work out. Notice Balak's not amongst those. It was He sent the Midianites... Well, the Lord told them to go against the Midianites. Hey, yes. Question about them. I might have missed it, so if I did, move forward. But I thought that at one point Balaam had a fear of the Lord of Israel. Yes, but he was not a priest of the Lord. So even he wasn't afraid in the sense that he wanted to become part of. Oh, well, no, no, no. There's no evidence at all that he was uh, trying to become a, a follower of the Lord. No, he uh, knew of Elohim. It says when we speak of him in the beginning uh, in Numbers, he spoke of the God of Israel. 
as I know there is a God over Israel, like there's a God over the Midianites and a God over the this group and that group. And each he just saw him as a God like every other God. Didn't know. Did not know him, Jackie. That's right. He did not know him. He knew of him. Thank you for that. Sir. He didn't know him to be the God, the creator God of the universe. Now he learned some stuff, but he found out he couldn't even speak in his own, his own thoughts. He had to speak what the Lord told him to speak. So he was not in control of that, but he went around it. Does, and he was then, of course, vengeance given against him. Does that mean that the Lord can use like non followers of him? To he even used the donkey. He can use anything or anybody. He is the sovereign creator God of the universe. He created everything and he controls everything, and there is nothing he cannot do. Yeah. He used Balaam and he used the donkey and he used um, many others. So that, that's good. The Israelites, big mistake that they're going to have to learn, they took the women and their dependents calf, uh, captive and the plunder. And they brought everything back, those prisoners, animals, spoiled of war, to Moses, who was back at the headquarters of the camp, uh, somewhere near where the tabernacle would be. They brought them back. Look, here's what we did. Did Moses say, oh, man, you guys did so good. What? You didn't kill the women? Guys, they were called a problem to begin with. Don't you think that you, but look, be a little bit gentle. Killing the women and the children and the animals, that's hard. Let's take the point of Caroline about spiritual warfare or Sarah's point about family members. I want you to get rid of that from your family. It's destroying your family. You have to get rid of it. But it's my family. Get rid of it. It's tough to be obedient. It's tough to be obedient. But you have to be obedient to get the blessing. No blessing without obedience. That's the Lord's economy. He set it out in the garden. Blessing for obedience, curses for disobedience. From the very beginning, from the very beginning. So Moses said, well, it says in verse 14, he's furious. Yeah. Now Moses is in the last months of his life. He knows he's in the last months of his life. He knows this is the last job he was sent to do that he would have to do with his people. And he, he sees, oh man, they have messed up. They haven't got it yet. This is the generation that's supposed to go into the land and they don't have it yet. They don't know it yet. I think that's why Deuteronomy had to come because they hadn't got it. It's hard. It's hard. And we need to see that. We have to get it. And we have to have a Moses in our life who says, uh-uh. This isn't, this isn't going to make it. It's not going to make it. So 
he became furious with the officers, the commanders of thousands, the commanders of hundreds, and those returning from military campaign. Have you let every female live? Yet they are the ones who, at Balaam's advice, incited the uh, Israelites to unfaithfulness against the Lord in the Peor incident. And that was literally what they called it from then on. So that the plague came against the Lord's community. Now, verse 17, kill every male among the dependents, the children, male children, and kill every woman who has been uh, sexually active. That would be childbearing age at that time or marriageable age at that time and older. So what have you got left? The very uh, young uh, girls and maybe, uh, uh, and maybe that was it. I think every male among the dependents. So you had a few girls that would survive this. You are to remain outside the camp for seven days. Remember when you um, are involved in death and destruction, you are unclean and you cannot come into the camp. And we read about their uh, cleansing the purity. Remember the red heifer ashes and the cleansing, purifying work. And that would continue uh, with, with the wars. Um, and you were to remain. And then the priest Eliezer said to the soldiers who had gone into battle, this is the legal statute the Lord commanded Moses. And then he talked about the spoils, how the spoils would be taken care of. And that would be forever after how the spoils of war would be done. Um, and they would figure out if it would survive fire, you could cleanse the spoils through fire. If the if it couldn't survive the fire, you had to cleanse them with the cleansing water with the red heifer ashes in it. And so um, we we have an accounting of the um, captives that were remaining who had to be uh, killed, and we find the sheep and goats, the cattle and donkey and the people and all the females that were um, who had not gone to bed. There were apparently um, 32,000 uh, people, all the females who had not gone to bed. That's a large group of girls. So this was a very large battle. Five kings or five tribes against Israel. And there were 12,000 Israelite men fighting this battle. If there's 32,000 women, just girls, there must have been millions. Yes. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> it was a bloody situation there in the plains of Moab. Bloody, bloody situation. And so as we look at how everything was divided up, but read and read with me in verse 49. Your, your servants have taken a census of the fighting men under our command and not one of us is missing. 12,000 went to war. And 12,000 came home. Just like Abraham. Just like Abraham, which was the pattern. Why? Because they followed the Lord. They, they made one mistake, and you have to kind of give it to them a little bit. It's tough to kill women, children. It's tough. It's a horrible, horrible thing. Today, we have a Geneva Convention against it because it's so horrible. <laughs> of course, the bad guys don't follow the Geneva Convention, as we're reading about in some places with Afghanistan. Women and children are killed indiscriminately by the bad guys. But um, I, I just, this was part of the historical record. 12,000 went to war and 12,000 came home. Don't you know that they 
when they all came home and they were all okay after it was all said and done and they had done what they had to do, how that nation must have been revived. So we presented to the Lord an offering of the gold articles each man found, armlets, bracelets, rings, earrings, and necklaces, to make an atonement for ourselves before the Lord. They recognized that they were sent to defeat the enemy that had nearly destroyed them by corruption of idolatry. And they made atonement to the Lord for it. We'll jump back now in the little bit we have. I want to jump back to, um, in the meantime, <laughs> between the events at the incident at Peor and the battle with the Midianites, there was a period of time, we don't know how long, uh, probably only a few weeks, uh, but a period of time that is sort of discussed in 26, 27, uh, 28, 29, 30. Okay, but we won't go through all of those, but I want to bring up and share screen here for a second. Um, one of the handouts we had from before. This is that table of census, which we had the very first census was when they arrived in Egypt as the sons of Jacob. Jacob and his sons and all of their sons and, and grandsons and so forth uh, arrived in Egypt. And remember there were 70, but we're only counting men. And I don't know if that first count was of those 20 and older, but it could very well have been. And then what we had when they left, uh, we had the count, the very first census of the nation of men, the men over 20, and they were sent to go and they would have to conquer the land. So we need to know how many men who can fight there are. And they, uh, the Lord said, those who are 20 and older who can fight. Count me how many there are. There were 600,000 and that was the growth Remember, they multiplied and multiplied and multiplied, even though Egypt tried to kill them all. And they multiplied to 600,000 from 70. Then they were at the uh, base of the Sinai, packing up everything, getting ready to set out for the promised land. After they had been there about a year probably just, just a little over a year. So they counted everybody except the Levites. Why didn't they count the Levites? Never fight. Levites were to never fight. What was their responsibility? Phineas showed us. Take care of the tabernacle, the articles of the tabernacle, and the work of the tabernacle. That's your job. And it was everybody else's job to protect the Levites so that they could do that job. The center of the nation was the worship of the Lord at the tabernacle, the center of everything. That was their lives. And the Levites were the ones who did the daily upkeep and work of the, of the tabernacle and the, and the ministry of the priesthood and all of that stuff, which was the center of the worship of the tribes of Israel. And so everybody else was responsible for taking care of that center of their livelihood. So everybody but the Levites, they had gained 3,550 men. So they were doing pretty well for a year in the wilderness. They were growing. Now, there would have been, I'm sure, natural deaths and, and all of that perhaps in that group, but they gain. But let's take a look now at chapter 26, which is the second generation's census. And this is pretty much after um, 
the 38 years or so of wandering in the wilderness and every single one of those 6,000, 603,550 men had to be dead. Why? Because of the curse of their disobedience at Kadesh. They were to, their carcasses would drop in the wilderness. The only two who were 20 and over were Caleb and Joshua. Aaron was gone, all, everybody was gone. Moses would not go into the land, but he was present at this time when the census was collected, but he was not among them, he would not be counted among them. But this second generation is now the number that's going to be going into the land. They would have, these men would have been um, under 20 at Kadesh and then those born. So this, what do we end up with? We have 601,730. We have a loss here of the number, but <clears throat> Still a pretty good number here, but that's how many would be available to fight in the land when they cross the river. These would be the fighting men. I want you to notice which tribe lost the most. Look at 59,000 to 22,000. Mm -hmm. Is it is it Simeon? I can't see things. Simeon. This is Simeon all across here. Who was the incident at Peor about? Look up all those little cues in the scripture. They're there for a reason. The Simeonites were almost wiped out. He didn't wipe out the whole tribe. God will protect them and carry them till Revelation. Simeon's listed in the book of Revelation as one of the tribes, so they were wiped out. Terry, are there people today that can take their living back here? There are some who say they can, but it's very, uh, very few, and it's, there's no documentation. The documentation of the tribes was pretty much wiped out when uh, Jerusalem was sacked by the Romans in 70 AD. So I'm sure there are some who have had some records and perhaps they can. The Lord knows that's, and that's really the only important one, I guess. Now, the biggest tribe, if you combine the two tribes of Joseph, which is Manasseh and Ephraim together, he would be, he got the double portion of blessing from Jacob, and, and both his sons then became as if their sons, so that made the 12 tribes, but if you combine them as the sons, they would make the biggest tribe, but uh, if you don't combine the tribe, the sons of Judah are the now the largest, and they were one. There, not all of them grew, but this one grew um, over the thirty-eight years. Now, let's just take a uh, along with this census. Take a look at chapter twenty-six, and I just want you to notice uh, Reuben, <clears throat> uh, the. In verses 5, 26, 5 through 9, talk about Reuben. That was the oldest son of Jacob. And there we have the number registered there. But there is a discussion here about, um, remember Dathan and Abiram and the Korah incident? No. Yes. The ground opened up and followed them. Pardon me? Yeah. But it says there were, uh, they serve as a warning sign there. Verse 11 of chapter 26, the sons of Korah, however, did not die. Why? They didn't join in. Not all the sons of Korah joined in and they did not die. 
Korah's followers fought against the Lord. The earth opened up its mouth and swallowed them. Kate, there's, there's Moses is writing the record in case you forgot, but it was back there. So that was, they were Reubenites, two of the family groups that were destroyed in the opening of the earth were Reubenite. That was, Reuben was not, uh, it was, it was prophesied by Jacob that Reuben would not do well. The tribe of Reuben would not do well. Simeon, the smallest, I think is directly due to the Peor incident. Gad is there. They did pretty well. Judah, but look at Judah. Now, Judah is the one in Genesis. Uh, we have the description of Judah's sons. His, his original sons, Ur and Onan, died. Remember, because they were so evil, God took them. And they his descendants are listed Perez, the Perizzites kind of underline Perez because that's the line of the Lord Jesus that's listed in Matthew. You see how it's, I mean, there's a record from the very beginning of this. There's a documentation, if you will, of, of their position. Uh, you can look at the tribes of uh, Joseph. Uh, they're listed there in verse 28. Uh, as the combined Manasseh and Ephraim, but they had divisions uh, because Manasseh was given some land and uh, Ephraim was given land. But if you look at those two together, uh, but Ephraim later on, we will see is uh, the tribe that uh, Joshua comes from. And it is Ephraim that separates away and they become the northern tribes when Israel is divided many years later after Solomon's death. We see that Dan has only one clan of descendants. The Shunammite. So, and then we have Asher and Naphtali. The total is listed there. There are a few less. And then we have the discussion of the tribes, uh, the tribe of Levi and the purpose of, of them. And we have them broken out into um, uh, clans as well. And look at uh, chapter 26, verse 63 with me. These were the ones registered by Moses and the priest Eliezer when they registered the Israelites on the plains of Moab. This is before the Midianite War, before they were selected, uh, the 12,000 per tribe, or the 1,000 per tribe and so forth. But this is when they did the census and knew how many in the second generation would be going into the land. This was uh, the census that was ordained by God to be done. But among them that was not, um, not one of those who had been registered by Moses and the priest Aaron when they registered the Israelites in the wilderness of Sinai. Not one, except for Caleb and Joshua. Was this the same Joshua that went up with Moses on the mountain? Yeah. Um, and what tribe is Moses from? Levi. Moses is a Levite. Aaron's brother. His brother Aaron. Joshua would have been 20, I reckon that he died at 110, and we see that at the end of Joshua and all that, if you do all the reckoning, he would have been about 25 when they left Egypt. So plus 40, he's 65. Caleb was probably close to that, 60, 65, something like that. 
So these are the oldest men in Israel. The oldest men in Israel. 65. And they lived past 100, probably typically at that particular time as we see with them. Okay, I'll stop sharing for the census there. But uh, we have a sort of an interesting thing now. Moses has, uh, he has begun the job of saying, okay, we've got to get this generation. We know how many there are. We've got to get this generation ready to go into the land. And so he began this um, final push to prepare these people. And what was he interested in? They needed to know the covenant and the laws that were part of the covenant. They needed to know about that covenant. They weren't there when that covenant, when the, when they, People said, we all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient back in Sinai. They weren't there. None of these were there. So uh, he has to uh, set it out. Now, we have one little kind of interesting piece in chapter 27. I don't want to spend much time on it, but I think this is there for is so instructive for us about who how the lord views women and how he has taught israel to view women and let's just take just a minute and consider in the world at that time women were property of the men in their lives, either their fathers or their husbands or their older brothers or somebody, they were property. They were of no more value than sheep or uh, cows. And in some cases, probably not as valuable, thought of as valuable as animals. They had no standing. They could not inherit anything. They were destitute if they were left without the men who would be responsible for them, such as with widowhood and so forth. And so it was a really big, bright, shining light to have this nation begin to look at women with value or give them value. That's one of the lessons I think we've got to get from this little chapter tucked in here in the midst of all the rest of them. The daughters of Zelophehad, <laughs> I guess, came and approached um, Moses. Now it gives us their history. They are the daughters of this man who was at the time old of the first generation. So he would be dead because he would have died in the wilderness. And so he had no sons. And in, at that time, the legal thing, property had to go to sons. Father to son, to son usually the oldest son, but father to son. And uh, the land would never leave that tribe or that family because of that. It would always go to son. And th they said, we've got this situation here where there's five girls, no boys. And they came and stood before Moses and said, and the entire community or the elders probably, and said, this is, we've got to fix this. This isn't right. Because it's not their fault their father fell in the <laughs> in the wilderness and we're left and there's no hope for us to get any uh sons now that's that's gone there's no no brothers going to be coming um and so um it it says uh, our father died in the wilderness but he was not among Korah's followers who gathered against the lord instead he died because of his own sin and he had no sons uh, that was verse three. 
Why should the name of our father be taken away from his clan since he had no son? And they were making their argument in front of, uh, of uh, Moses. And Moses said, well, I don't know what to do about this. Tell me what to do, Lord. And so he goes and the Lord tells him what to do. What these daughters say is correct. The Lord tells Moses, you are to give them hereditary property among their fathers, brothers, and transfer their father's inheritance to them. First time this will ever have been done and recorded in history. They have the same value for inheritance purposes as sons. If there are no sons, the daughters should not be left out. So the statement will be, tell the Israelites, here's the new rule. When a man dies without having a son, transfer his inheritance to his daughter. First time a daughter had some standing and worth. I, I don't think we ought to read past that real fast. This is slightly amended in the last chapter in chapter 36. We'll uh, get to that in a minute. But uh, the, the thing is, this was from the tribe of Manasseh. This, this situation was in the tribe of Manasseh, who was uh, Joseph's son. And this was uh, eventually would be a very, very large tribe with a very large land holding. Um, well, turn to chapter 36 just for a quick overview. I don't want to spend too much time with it but 36 kind of has an amendment it's almost as if it's added on uh to the story to kind of clarify because they said well well wait a second these women who hold this land they get married and now that land belongs to their husbands but that was of our land, Manasseh's land, and it would go to say um, uh, Gad's land or uh, Issachar's land or something, depending on who they marry, right? So we need to clarify, the land stays with their tribe, doesn't get transferred to the husband. Lord Jesus came, especially in the book of Luke, we see many instances of how he treated women with this same value. In the eyes of the Lord, there is no male and female. They're just people. Very important lesson, I think, for us. Okay. Women should speak up and ask, because what if she didn't ask? Well, yeah, at least they spoke went and spoke up, and spoke up and said, we're in this trouble. There's five of us girls. Yeah. What's going to happen to, to our father's land and his inheritance? Back to chapter 27 for a very important statement. Verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, this is after um, uh, some work has been done with clarifying the census and making these rules and so forth. Now, the census was collected for the purpose of inheritance. They would need to know the lots, how many, you know, do the lot, uh, uh, dividing up by lots, but we need to know how many are going to be in each clan and where they'll be. And so this census was collected for the purpose of uh, living in the land by lot and how it would be done, as well as how many would be able to fight. So, sorry, Moses, uh, oh, the Lord told Moses, and I think this is just, remember Moses is writing this, and it's almost as if he's writing a memoir. memoir. <laughs> Go up to this mountain of the Abiram range, that would be the Pisgah Mount um, Nebo, 
which is present on many tours to the Holy Land these days. You can go and visit Mount Nebo and so forth. Uh, go up and see the land that I have given the Israelites. Now, he had already been told in the wilderness since the, he disobeyed the Lord about the rock, striking the rock instead of speaking to it. Um, he knew he wasn't going into the land, but this is sort of a bonus that the Lord is. I'm going to take you up and let you see all the land that's going to be for this people that I have. After you have seen it, you will also be gathered to your people. Remember, that was a, a phrase only for God's people, gathered to your people. Yes, it would be essentially in the bosom of Abraham. <laughs> sort of that picture we see in the New Testament. When the community quarrel, uh, he, he just reminds him, remember when you quarreled in the wilderness of Zen, both you and your brother rebelled against my commandment to demonstrate my holiness in their sight of, uh, at the waters. And so Moses appealed to the Lord. Look at this shepherd's heart. 120-year-old man who's been for, through 40 years of trouble. Just one thing after another with this group of people. And he's not real great pleased with the second group, second generation at this point. But he appealed to the Lord. May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all, appoint a man over the community. At this time, he didn't know it was going to be Joshua until this point. Who will go out before them and come back in? And we're going to see the go out and come in reference over and over and over. That means get up and go out and do the work of the Lord for the day and then come back in at night and stay and then get up and go out and come in. It was doing life, living life, working, giving who's going to go out and come in. Who will bring them out and bring them in? So that the Lord's community or the assembly or the church, actually that's translated in the Greek uh, Septuagint as the church, as the Lord's church, won't be like sheep without a shepherd. How do you think he understood that? He had spent 40 years in the Sinai wilderness taking care of sheep, and he knew what happens when there's no shepherd. The Lord Jesus would often refer to this. And God in Ezekiel, the Lord in Ezekiel talks about this. These are my people like a, she like a sheep without a shepherd. They just scatter and wander because they don't have someone to follow. So the Lord told Moses, take Joshua. Who has the big letter S, spirit the Holy Spirit in him already. Joshua has the Spirit already in him and lay your hands on him, meaning in front of all of the camp, the anointing process is carried on with leadership, just like it would be would have been with the priest. The whole anointing and setting apart to do the work was had already been described for the priest. Now it would be done for the leadership. And from this point on, the king would be anointed. The king had to be anointed. So the spirit of the Lord, lay your hands on him, have him stand before the priest Eleazar, the whole community, and commission him in their sight. <clears throat> Confer some of your authority on him so that the entire Israelite community will obey him meaning he has he's been taught and I have taught him and I give him my authority just what the Lord gave me I'm giving him my authority here's the man follow him this is the one the Lord has appointed and so um he will stand before the priest Eleazar, who will consult the Lord for him, 
with the decision of the Urim. You see how that's going to work? And from now on, every leader of the people will have a priest that will serve him to give him, thus says the Lord. This is what the Lord says about this situation. And we'll see when, Sol when um, Saul, David, Solomon, others would go to the priest and ask them what to do about this. We especially get that in a lot of, of the stories with David. He would go to the priest. At that time, it was Nathan. For, for um, and he, but also we would send a prophet uh, for this same purpose. But where was the Urim? Anybody remember the Thuman, Orem and the Thuman? In the pouch was behind the breast piece that the high priest wore, um, which was the representation, all the jewels, the 12 jewels for each tribe was a representation of all of the tribes of Israel. See how the order of uh, how things are going to run, how the government has been set up now. So who's in charge of Israel? God is. But I want you to have Eliezer anoint Joshua to lead my people. Then we go through and 28, 29, 30 have um, a repeat of the worship and the laws that said there are three festivals that must be kept by all of Israel every year. And so it lists the beginning um, with the Passover, the first fruits and so forth, but it goes through the uh, what are called the appointed times. Remember the appointed times, which were the festivals for specific at specific times for specific reasons to do. What was the purpose of the festivals? Anybody remember? God said, "I want you to do this. in Leviticus." It was spelled out Leviticus. Do it this, this, and this on the certain month, a certain day, in this way. Teach your children. That's later. What was the purpose of the feasts or festivals? Remember. Remember. Remember who I am, what I've done for you. Remember. 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 Because that's how you know who the Lord is. Remember what he's done. And so uh, observing the appointed times and offerings is a picture of fellowship and relationship, I think. And you start, and in this one, you would, um, there was a, 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 for the seventh, uh, the, the seventh month festivals, which was uh, sort of the feast of, uh, of remembering that the Lord kept you through the wilderness. Um, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Shelters or the Feast of Booths or Shokot uh, is more described in chapter 29, where they had on each of the days how many bulls and sheep and so forth to kill. It's all a lot of detail there. But the idea was you start the day with worship and you end the day with worship. Start the day with worship and you end the day with worship. That was how you were to organize your life. And every year, there would be three times a year when you would gather as a people, as a group, as a community, and remember what I've done for you. Whether it's celebrating daily or weekly or monthly or annually, make worship a routine and disciplined and for the purpose of remembrance. It must become the thing 
that is most valued in a person's life. Central to the life, the right relationship with the Lord. Okay, I, I a lot of this is detail in um, instructions to each of these um, uh, tribes, and I, I'm just going to quickly go through some of the things in 33 and so forth. I know you might not have read ahead, but uh, and we'll pick up with this uh, with the first four chapters of Deuteronomy for next week. To, because they're part of or a continuation of that. But I just want to point out in 33, um, let's see, 33, 34, part of it is there as well. 33 is the listing of, I, I just called it the um, journal of Moses, his, his journal that he must have kept from when they left Egypt, because there's so much detail, it would have had to have been written down and kept, because we have uh, the starting point and the journey, and from Ramses all the way to the plains of Moab, detailed here, and I forgot there's something like 60 spots listed there. We aren't told how long they stayed at every spot, but every spot they came to and stopped, apparently, is listed here. And so you can track their whole trip. Yes. Um, do you think that, I know they started and stopped when God told them to. Okay, so when they're going from one place to the other, because they, they never stop in between from point A to point B. Correct? Probably not. They probably walked or moved from one point to the next because um, they would have had to stop during the day for food and bathroom breaks and all of that sort of thing, traveling. But to stop and set up the tabernacle and stay for a few days, yeah. And and of course they were traveling with old people and babies and all of that. So they would have had to, and, and it's the time with animals, so they would have had to uh, take that into account. But I, I think it's just very instructive for us that there's no wondering what happened. It started at Ramses and it ended in the plains of Moab. It would have only, and we'll see in, in Deuteronomy, it should have only taken 11 days. <laughs> That's kind of discouraging. <laughs> and that's 40 years. It took them 40 years. Okay, uh, 34, 30. Let's see, let me find my 35. Here it is. Um, I wanted to just speak in 35, the Levites would not get an inheritance of land. What they would get would be cities in which they would raise their families, settle down and raise their families. And there would be what are called Levitical cities set up throughout the land. And remember, these were the resource people for worship, and for training. And they would have the scribes, the ones who would keep all the records and write all the records and so forth. These were the, uh, from them would come judges and teachers and, and of course a priest and so forth. And so the, there would be all throughout the land, there would be Levitical cities. And you can look, up, there's a map of that sort of thing. But Detailed in chapter 35 are what are called the six, six cities of refuge. I think this is just an interesting thing that God designed to be put. I think there were 13 or I forgot how many Levitical cities spread all around, but six of the cities 
were designated to be refuge uh, spots, cities of refuge. And what did that mean? Look at verse chapter 35, verse 6. The cities you give the Levites will include six cities of refuge, which will provide so that one who kills someone, and this was, um, I guess, what we call today manslaughter, <laughs> where you don't intentionally kill somebody or something, uh, but you did. Uh, you can flee there. And at that time, when you flee there, it was the job of that community to adjudicate that case. And I'm just kind of pulling this all from all of these things together. But you were to adjudicate the case. Did this person kill this? Was this an accident, so to speak, unintentional? Or is there murder here? Which of the two happened? If there was murder, they had to throw that person out for the capital punishment that they deserved. And the family would have to come and take care of that. But if it was adjudicated that it was an accidental death and that um, you know it was unintentional, something happened and you know, whatever, it, something happened and they, uh, they were the cause of somebody else's death. If they got to the city of refuge, and it talks about some of them barely made it in, when they were running for their lives, they would head, every Israelite in the country knew where those six cities were, how far it would it be to get there if you needed to run to that city. If you got there and your case was adjudicated, you stayed in that city until that priest died. Then you can leave. But you had to stay there. In other words, you didn't run and, and, and they say, okay, we, we agree it was an accident. You can go back home. No, they had to stay there. So it was essentially a sentence but it wasn't the sentence of death. And that was designed by the Lord as this is gonna happen. Something's gonna happen and you need, we need to have a place, but you had to get away from the family of the one you killed because they would, they would take it on themselves and you'd have the Hatfields and the McCoys. Fights <laughs> were spread out. Did each one of the cities have a tabernacle or no, no, no. They would have what today are called synagogues. It was the responsibility of the Levite in the town that they lived or the villages that were near that Levite town. And it does say there will be in addition, give them 42 other cities. So that would be uh, 48. 48 cities, which is a lot of cities when you look at the size of, but it was the responsibility for them to have the school, to teach the boys how to read and write and know the law, because the boys would grow up and marry and their household had to follow the law, the covenant and the law. So it was the job of the, of the Levite tribe to train up uh, the generations through school. And they would do that in a community type setting. And it was done uh, uh, associated with, uh, you know, if, if it was time to plant, there was no school. <laughs> everybody was out doing the planting and then they would come when there was time when everybody could get together and not give up the work of their daily lives that they would have to do. But it was the responsibility of the, of the, community to train up the boys to become men who would know the law and could carry out the law and that would carry it on from generation to generation 613 laws they had to remember anybody remember that little thing that was on their garment yeah. the blue tassel so it was uh but it was set up that way and then of course the last chapter there of uh of numbers is the of the 
sort of the addendum to the daughters and the community that would be uh, if if they get married, you can't give the land to their husband because it would take it away from from their territory. And so it, that was settled and put into writing. Uh, back in another chapter earlier, there is uh, a discussion about for Reuben and Gad, two of the sons and their tribes, wanted to stay on the east side of the river. And that lush pasture land, they wanted to stay there. And uh, so they came, we want to stay. And Moses said, you're going to stay here and the other 10 are going to have to go over and, and do all the fighting and, and, and take the land. No. And the Reubenites and Gadites had to say, no, we, our men, our fighting men will go as long as the conquering has to happen. We will go and fight. We'll live our, leave our women and children back here, but we'll go across the river with you and fight and take the land and then we'll come home. And Moses agreed, and it was put down that your lot will be here and your lot will be here. And it turns out that half of Manasseh was on that side as well. So um, it became what would today be a good hunk of Jordan. The country of Jordan would have been part of Israel at that time. So kind of interesting. Very last sentence in the book of Numbers. These are the commands and ordinance the Lord commanded the Israelites through Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. Do we know where they were? Absolutely. A lot of detail in this book, but a lot of lessons. Now, next week is the last week of this section, section three. It'll be the 30th, ses 30th session, if you will. But next week is the end of 10, a group of 10, and then we have a break, as we've seen. So what are we going to do next week? We're going to do a little review. <laughs> we want to see how much you remember. Now, there's hardly any point at all in doing Bible study if it doesn't come in and change your life, change the way you think, change what you know about the Lord, because this is how we get to know the Lord. So it's one thing to learn all this stuff, but it's another thing to say, okay, what do I need to do about this what how is that going to change the way i think i was just refreshed again this week when i looked at that chapter on those daughters coming and saying this isn't right and the lord said they've got a point let's put this down in writing first woman's movement <laughs> it would be what what was that called the um suffrage <laughs> women's suffrage but do you see the lord confirmed the value of women in that way they get the same right as men for inheritance of the land so important for us to learn okay i'm going to finish here with the recording